What I'm going to preach on this morning is hell. And um, I'm just going to tell you that there is a growing heresy uh, appearing in churches everywhere concerning the issue of hell. Um, what used to be evangelical churches are changing their minds and their opinions on what hell is. And um, to me, you cannot be evangelical without preaching and teaching about hell. Because people, if people come to Christ for the wrong reason, they won't stay. You say, where do you get that from? I get that from the parable of the seed. Because some of the seed fell upon stony ground. And those who heard the word received it with joy, the Bible says. And in some cases, a gospel, not the gospel, but a gospel is presented to people that promises to give them a better life here or promises them wealth promises them a healthy body with no disease or makes some sort of claim to them that God has no intention of holding on to because God did not make that claim. And when that claim is not fulfilled, those people fall out and the Bible says that they're worse off then than they ever were before they heard that. Because now they think that all churches are like that and they won't touch them. They won't come anywhere near where the Bible's being preached because they think, well, they're just after my money or they're just trying to make a, a servant out of me or whatever. And so church after church after church is changing its doctrine on hell and I, I know why they're doing it. And I'm going to show that this morning. But I think it's important to understand what hell is, what it isn't, why the devil wants it hidden away, why he does not want people to know about it. Um, I'm going to tackle issues of what you believe about hell and why you're wrong. Okay, now I'm not, I'm not going to preach any heresy or anything like that. What I mean by that is, some people put it in their mind that either hell doesn't exist, or you go there and you're done away with and you don't think of anything, you're annihilated and that's it, you don't have to worry about anything, or people worse than you go there but you don't. Well, let me set the record straight. There is nobody worse than you. Okay? And us comparing ourselves with other people, the Bible says you're not wise. Amen. Because if you justify your own sins by the deeds and sins of others, you're wrong in doing that. God is not going to take you and measure you against everybody else. He's not going to do that. He's going to take you and measure you by you. And your deeds and what you believed. That's how he's going to judge you according to his law book, the Bible. And the things that you have done in this life are going to be brought back. The Bible says that a book is open. That book is your deeds. If you've ever stood in court before where you were called to court by a judge because of something you did, then you know what I'm telling you is true. Because when you stand before a judge, there's somebody there with a book on you and they open that book and read the things that you did that were a violation of the law. And they're not judging you on what everybody else did. 
You get pulled over for speeding, and it might make you mad because there was 20 other people that you were with that was doing the same speed. But the bottom line is, when they pulled you over, you were the one that was guilty. Doesn't matter who else was guilty and got away with it. You were guilty. So think about you and the things that you have done or the things that you are doing now and measure yourself against, not everybody else, but against God's law. What God said is right and what God said is wrong. And understand that in every nation in this world, there is a court system that rewards right deeds and punishes bad deeds. Some do it better than others, but every court, every nation in the world punishes evildoers. God's court is no different. And there is not a court, at least in this country, that I am aware of that will allow you to weigh good deeds versus the bad deeds that you've done. The one time I had to stand before a judge for breaking the speed limit, I broke it bad too. The one time I had to, they wouldn't let me pay it, I had to go stand before a judge and I tried everything to get out of it and God wouldn't let me because God wanted to show me something. I was there with a bunch of other people in this city courthouse and they opened a book on me and they, they read the charges and they asked me how I, what my plea was. You know what I said? Guilty. You know why? I was. I was guilty. They did not ask me how good a person I was. They did not ask me if I, during that day, if I had done other good deeds. They asked me on that particular charge whether I was guilty or innocent, and I said guilty. God is not going to do what you think he's going to do with your good deeds. There's a sermon on that I preached here about a year or so ago called an unjust balance. And what happens is we like to put our, our deeds in a balance and we always tip the scale, don't we? We always make ourselves out better than what we really are. God's not going to let you get away with that because he knows better. God knows what you thought of. God knows what you lusted after. God knows what you said, what you did. Not only that, God knows what you're going to say and what you're going to do and what you're going to think. There's no way out of it. You're going to stand before God guilty and he has a punishment for your crimes. Deuteronomy chapter 32, are you there? Verse 15. But Jeshurun, and I had to look that up last night, Jeshurun is a name for Israel. Alright? It's, it's another name for Israel. But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. You know what that means? It means you've been eating good. And if you've been eating good, it's because God fed you well. Amen? Look at us. I mean, in, in, in America, we're fat people. Why? We've got buffets everywhere. We've got 1,000 calorie hamburgers that we can eat. Amen? Okay? We're covered with fatness. Then... He forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. So what has happened in America? In, in the depression, everybody was praying. In the depression, 
in this country, schools led children in prayer over their meals. They said grace over their lunch because they were grateful to have a piece of bologna and a piece of bread to go with it and a cup of water. Your granddad and your grandma was thankful for what they had because they didn't have much. And they weren't very fat either. But then God blessed our nation. And we became rich. We became wealthy. And as we become rich and wealthy, we forget God because we don't need Him. Amen? Amen? So we forsake God and lightly esteem the rock of our salvation. We don't care anymore. We don't want God. Don't need Him. We're fat. We've got food everywhere. We've got money in the bank. We've got this and we've got that. So we don't need God anymore. Let's kick Him out of every place. Let's forget about the Ten Commandments. Let's, let's hide that from our children. Let's not tell them that what they did was wrong. So verse 16. They provoked Him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they Him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God. To gods whom they knew not. To new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. America used to be a Christian nation. Used to have churches everywhere. Now churches are having to compete with all these other religions everywhere. Rising up in the late, in the 60s and the 70s. With the increase of drug use comes an increase in false religious ideas. They go hand in hand. Verse 18. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Who made you in your mother's womb? God formed you in there. You know what? God owns you. Do you know how? You are made by way of an instruction manual that God himself wrote. It's called DNA. Psalm 139, 16. In thy book, all my members were written. It's God's book. God owns you because God made you and you forgot about him. And this country doesn't care about God anymore. And listen, I don't hate my country. I love America. I love being an American. I'm proud of our country. And when I say that, I'm not talking about the bad deeds of the government, the bad deeds of people. I love this land and I love my own people. That doesn't make me a racist. Just, I love my people. You can love your people. But we forgot God. And when we forget God, we forget that God has rules to live by. And when we forget that God has rules to live by, then we forget that there's punishment for breaking those rules. Who in here, raise your hand if you got a spanking in school. Let me put it like this. Raise your hand if you lived in a time when they spanked children in school. There we go. Now I don't feel so bad. <laughs> they don't spank kids in school anymore. You got a spank in school and you got one at home. And I hated that. But I want to unhook the train for a little bit. You reminded me of something, Roy. Let me, tell you, let me tell you where America is right now. There was a time in America when a child in America had three primary influences in their life. Their mother and dad, their pastor, and the school teacher. And there was a time when those three agreed as to how that child was to be raised. They were in agreement. So that child grew up knowing that mom and dad and the pastor who represents the Ten Commandments and the school teacher was not going to let that child get away with a bunch of foolishness. 
They grew up knowing that. Amen. Then, in the 40s and 50s and 60s, the radios started moving into the homes. And the children, when the transistor radio got in, children were able to listen to things outside of what their mom and dad was listening to in the family room. In the family room, the radio shows were all decent and family-oriented. But then, when the kids started moving the radios into the room, they started listening to things that mom and daddy wouldn't go let them listen to. I, listen, I know exactly what I'm talking about. Then, now that child now has a, has a different, someone who is influencing their life outside of mom and dad, outside of the pastor, outside the school teacher. So what has happened is now the parents, mom and dad, don't even agree anymore as to how that child's going to be raised. They don't care about what the pastor says. And the school thinks that they own the children. And you should serve the school's desires for your child and not the school serving the parents' desires. And now that child is, does not have a consistent role model to live by, so they choose what they're listening to in their ears. Am I right? This, this is where we got to in America. Okay? Now I'm going to hook the train back up. So watch this. Verse 18 again. Of the rock thou be, that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Verse 19, And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. Every sin that you committed provoked God. When, when you committed fornication, you provoked God. When you committed adultery, you provoked God. When you rebelled against authority, you provoked God. When you were lascivious in your thoughts, you provoked God. So verse 20, And he said, I will hide my face from them, and I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. Where's the faith of America? It's not the Bible anymore. People put their faith in government. That's the wrong place. Wrong, wrong, wrong place. People put their faith in themselves. People put their faith in their money. People put their faith in all kinds of things, but they don't have faith in God anymore. 21. They have moved, they have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with, the, with, those people which, with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. This is God prophesying of the Gentiles being saved. Okay? But I believe it could play here in America too. God says, I will provoke them to jealousy with those that are not a people, and I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. What would you think if God completely forsook America and just moved over to Kenya? Kenya, most people don't think of Kenya or any of the other African nations. They're left behind. Okay? And I can tell you that in many ways they're foolish people. Now that is not, that's not a hateful statement. It's not a racist statement. I'm just telling you. But God could leave America and move to Africa and make them the top of the world instead of us and turn us into a third world country. He could do it in a month if he wanted to. Verse 22, now this, this is the message right here. For a fire is kindled in mine anger. A fire. Here's what you need to know about hell. The one thing you have got to know and understand about hell. It is on fire. Now don't piddle that down to, well, 
What that really means is that it's separation from God. Don't reduce it. Don't turn it into a, a mindless grave. Don't turn it into anything that it's not. It is on fire. It is burning. And everybody that's in it right now is burning on fire. One of the worst ways to watch somebody die is to watch them burn. It is abhorrent to watch somebody burn in fire. Is it not? Think hell. Think right now of a loved one that you know is in hell right now. They are burning. They are screaming. The Bible says they are wailing and gnashing their teeth. They are in pain. They are in torments. It started the moment they were judged and found guilty by God. And it's still continuing. There is no doubt in my mind that the story that Jesus told in Luke 16 of the rich man was a true story. Jesus knew. He did not say, let's pretend that there was this guy. He did not say that. He did not say, let me tell you a, a fable. He did not say it was a fable. He said, there was a certain rich man. He knew who he was. He died. He was judged. He was sent to hell. He was there. He is still there. 2,000 years later, he is still there. And he's not leaving. He's not dead in the sense that you think of death. He is a living dead. And he is in torments. He is in agony. He is suffering. And his suffering and his torment will never stop. I've been in pain before. And they say, uh, can you tell us your pain on a scale of 1 to 10? I've had 10. And I begged for it to stop. Screaming. Anybody ever had diverticulitis? It's like there's a knife in your guts just twisting and stabbing and poking you and you are screaming in agony and you want it to stop. That's just a glimpse of hell. Mine stopped. Mine went away. There's no morphine in hell. It's serious stuff, isn't it? I didn't, I didn't want to go there first time I heard about hell, and I still don't want to go there. Being afraid to go to hell is the best way to change someone's behavior. It's the best way in the world. Okay? So you need to understand that hell really is on fire. Let's read that again. A fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn into the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. God's fire is so hot. Let me show you this. Okay, up on the screen. The earth's core is on fire. We know that. Remember those miners that were trapped in Chile? 
They were so far down. You ever, you ever been to Bonterre Mine? It, it runs about 50 some odd degrees down there all year long, doesn't it? Nice and cool. I always thought that the further down you went, the cooler it got. That's not true. Those, those miners that got trapped in Chile were so far down, it wasn't, it wasn't cold in there. It was hot. It was in the upper 90s. And they endured that for how long? Several couple months? They were stuck down there? Almost died? But the biggest thing they had to deal with was the heat. Because the farther down you go, but you write this down somewhere in your mind or in your Bible, the farther down you go, the hotter it gets. Are you listening to the preacher? The preacher's job is to warn you about hell. If I don't warn you about hell, I'm not doing my job. Okay? You think it's going to be hot this week? The, hot, the lower down you go in life, the hotter it gets. God's trying to convince you and tell you that you're going to a place that you're not going to like. Okay? That fire is so hot that it can set on fire the foundations of the mountains. God knows how. Lava comes up from a place that's not even the core of the earth. And you can't get anywhere near it. It's that hot. Okay? Verse 23. I will heap mischiefs upon them. I will spend mine arrows upon them. Verse 24. They shall be burnt with hunger. Think about it. In hell, you can't even get a sip of water. Much less anything to eat. In heaven, we get led by still waters. We get to eat at the table of God. That's heaven. Hell's the opposite. God said they shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and with bitter destruction. Hell is bitter. I will also send the teeth of beast upon them with the poison of serpents of the dust. The sword without and the terror within shall destroy both young man and the virgin, the suckling also with the man of gray hair. I said I would scatter them into corners. I would make the remembrance of them to cease from among men. Were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy, lest their adversaries should behave themselves strangely, lest they should say our hand is high and the Lord hath not done all this. For they are a nation void of counsel, neither is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. Oh, I wish that you would consider the end of your life, people. We think of what we want now. We think of our desires now and what satisfies us now and what makes us feel good now. But we don't consider the latter end of our life. That for all of the pleasures of life that we go through and all the things that we desire and all the lust that we fulfill upon our own flesh, we don't consider the end of our life. That for all of this, the Bible says, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, you will stand before God in judgment. You will give an account of every wrong thing that you did and every wrong thing that you thought. You're not getting away with anything. You will stand before God in judgment. Don't give me this nonsense about how good you are. Or about weighing your good against your bad. Or about hell doesn't exist. Or hell's just a grave. Or any of that other lie that you were told by somebody else. Some other religious person. Or the lie that you concocted in your own mind. Deep. Very deep down in your own consciousness. You know. That hell is real. You know it. And you're avoiding it. And you don't want to think about it. You don't want to hear about it. All you want is pleasures. You need to consider the latter end of your life.
every time you fell as lust after another woman, you go to hell for that. Every time one of you young ladies lust after a man, you go to hell for that. Every time you sleep with someone, commit fornication, you're going to hell for that. Every time you take something from somebody that doesn't belong to you, you're going to hell. Every time you talk about somebody behind their back and whisper about them and gossip about them and backbite them, you go to hell for that. Every time you rebel against authority. That doesn't just apply to these young people. Listen. That doesn't just apply to these young people. That applies to us adults who ought to know better. And when we're told to do something, you do it. If that person is in authority over you, you, you do it. If that's your boss, if that's your manager, if that's your leader, if that's the police, or whoever, if they tell you to do it, if it doesn't violate God's law, you do it. Rebellion's witchcraft. Witches go to hell. Every time, listen to me, every time you put yourself before God, you go to hell for that. Because you then become your own God. You're worshiping yourself. You're going to hell for that. Every time you act out of unbelief, whatsoever is not of faith is sin, the Bible says. And God just upbraided fat Israel. He said there are people of no faith. Every time you do that, you're going to hell for that. You are. God's, God's not going to put up with it. And you're not going to get away with it. And I don't care if what you did was 40 years ago. It's written down. No, no limitations in God's kingdom. No statute of limitations. God didn't get over it. It's written down. It's waiting for you in heaven. There are charges against you. And you're going to, God's going to send angels to arrest you when you take your last breath. They will take you before the judge. And the judge is not any of us in this world. It is God Almighty who will judge you. See, see, see people out there that like to live the lifestyle of a sinner. And they don't want anybody telling them what's wrong in their life. And they say, well, nobody judges me but God. You're exactly right, sister. And that's what I would be afraid of. It's exactly what I would be afraid of. So... Verse 21, they have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people, and I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Now, that was the preparation for the message. I'm not going to keep you long. I want to pray. And then I'm going to show you some things. Okay? You're here to learn. Amen? Amen. Here to learn. Somebody needs to hear this. Some Christian needs to be reminded not to get too high-minded. Some backslider needs to hear what's on the other side of sliding back. Some lost sinner needs to consider their latter end while they're sinning. Heavenly Father, God, if we would just consider what happens to us at the end of our life when we lie to people, when we steal from people, 
when we commit adultery or fornication, when we do nasty, lascivious deeds, when we rebel against authority, when we gossip and backbite people, when we hate people. God, if we would consider where, what our punishment would be for that, God, we would never do it. The fact, God, that there are things that we haven't done and depths that we haven't gone to is because, Father, we thought about what would happen to us if we did. And we realized that it was too high a price to pay. We're not going to do it. The pain of eternity outweighs the pleasure of a season. Father, help us to consider our latter end. Help us to understand and know what hell is, who's going there, who should go there, why you created it. Father, teach us the truth on it. Save the sinner. Draw the backslider back to you. Bring down, Lord, the, the pride of the saved. Humble us, dear God, before the cross once again. Bless your word. Honor it, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen. I found out something. There's a reason why churches don't preach on hell anymore. It's, it's, actually, it's a simple reason. Who in here knows the number of times the word hell is mentioned in the King James Bible? Who in here just happens to know that number? I mean, 54. 54 times the word hell is mentioned in the King James Bible. Okay? Now, there's other references to God said, God said a furnace of fire. Everlasting fire, everlasting torment, everlasting punishment. He uses terms like that. But the word hell itself, 54 times in the King James Bible. And you've heard me talk about how some of the modern translations have taken that out. The word, out of 54 occurrences, the word hell in the King James, it's missing 41 times in the NIV. Missing. It's missing 22 times in the New King James Version of the Bible. So if you ask me, Pastor, well, I've got a new King James Version. That's good enough, isn't it? Not if they took hell out 22 times. It's missing 41 times in the New American Standard, 40 times in the English Standard Version. In fact, uh, blueletterbible.org, I just I typed it in and got a list. The word hell, 54 times in the King James 32 times in the New King James, 17 times New Living Testament, 13 times the NIV, 14 times the English Standard Version, only 10 times in the Southern Baptist Own Bible, the Holman Christian Standard Bible. It's only 10 times. Hell is only mentioned 10 times in the Southern Baptist Bible. New American Standard, 13 times, 16 times New English Testament, 13 times Revised Standard Version, 13 times American Standard Version, 12 times the Darby's Bible, 40, 49 times. I don't know what the W.E. Bible is. I don't know what that is. But you can see, so when you take it out, it can't be preached on anymore. In fact, see all those where it's like in the teens, like 17, 13, 14, 10? You see that? Without fail, all of those are only New Testament times. In other words, the 13 times in the NIV, they're all in the New Testament. They've taken it out completely out of the Old Testament. Completely. They replace it with the Hebrew word Sheol. Sheol, if you just look up the definition of Sheol, it means great. So what are you telling people? That the punishment for your sins is... Just lay in a coffin. Maggots eat you and that's it. That's not punishment. That's vacation. That's retirement. That's rest from your party life and from your chasing women and smoking dope and drinking. That's retirement. That's not punishment. 
and they took it out. And leave it up to you to define what that means. So no wonder it's not preached on anymore. It's not taught. I'm going to give you a few things on the experience of hell. Number one, hell is constant sorrow. Whereas heaven is constant joy. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. That means they went before me. They, the snare, the trap of hell was laid right at the place where your sin was. And when you chased down that sin and committed it, the trap was shut and now you're going to hell. And who laid the trap for you? The same devil that tempted you to go in it to begin with. Psalm 111, 116, 3. The sorrows of death compass me and the pains of hell get hold upon me. Hell is painful. Who, is in, who in here is in pain right now? Something hurts on you right now. Magnify that a million times. You ever had a broken arm, broken bone? Broken bones hurt bad. You ever had skin burned? Burns hurt bad. Anybody ever had a baby? They hurt, don't they? But it was over with, wasn't it? Not in hell. Don't let anybody lie to you and tell you that it's the grave or it's separation from God and you're just, you're just going to have bad days down there. Oh, woe is me. A pity party. You are in constant pain and it never goes away. Matthew 5, 28. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. You know what that is? That's internet porn. That's where you lust after all the women and commit adultery with them in your heart. You know what you're going to get for that? Hell. The trap was set. You're going to hell. Is it worth it? Was the pleasure of your sin for a season worth it? So he said, if thy right hand offend thee, pluck it out. Or right eye offend thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee. For his prop I want to tell you something. You are better off having your eyes go blind on you. If you're hooked on internet porn or anything else, you're better off having your eyes go bad on you so you can't see than you are to go to hell with two eyes. For it's profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it's profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. That's the experience of hell. Mark 9, 46. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. You know what, the, you know what their worm is? I used to think that that was like there were worms in hell eating you. I used to think that that's not what that means anymore. You know what your worm is? Your worm is your soul. And there's, I want to show you this. There's a picture of it. Who in here has ever seen a caterpillar? That's a worm. What do caterpillars do? They go into a cocoon. That's death. And they lie dormant for a season. And you know what happens? At a certain time, they come out and they've got wings like an angel. They just fly around. God is showing you the transformation of the soul from death into you're like one of the angels now. I'm in heaven. Unless your soul transgressed the commandments of the Lord. 
And then your worm, your soul, goes into a place of everlasting living death. And it never, see, he's telling you that you're not just going to the grave and be annihilated and become unconscious for all of eternity. He's telling you that the fire is not quenched and you're going to know it for eternity. So he says in verse 43, if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. Sounds like a good idea, doesn't it? Verse 944, where they're warm, dieth not, the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. Verse 47, and if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes be cast into hell fire. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And you're in the fire. In agony. And never are you going to be let out. No end to the suffering. One more. Matthew 13, verse 41. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. Them which do iniquity. Who goes to hell? Who goes to hell? Them that do iniquity. Who's done iniquity? Raise your hand. All things that offend and them which do iniquity. I am sick and tired of doing funerals or being at a funeral and hearing everybody say, Oh, they're in a better place. Makes me sick. You know what that is? That's denial. And the next sermon I preach on this is going to be the denial of hell. Oh, well, if, if that drunkard in that casket, if that philandering, adultering drunkard is in heaven, then I'll go to heaven. That's why they do that. If that rat in that casket, that little slobbering drunk, fornicator, child abuser, if that guy is in heaven, then I'll go to heaven. That's why they do that. Oh, they're at peace now. They look so happy. They're in a better place now. They finally got their rest. No, they're not. They're screaming. They're wailing. Look at this. Look at this. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. You know what that is? That's what that is. That is being in so much pain that you are gnawing your teeth down to the root because you're in so much pain. And it never stops. Luke 16, 24, this is the rich man. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And said, listen, the mercy you should be asking for now, not in hell. You can have it now, but you cannot have it in hell. Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Then send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this plague. Never stops. Did he get his water? Abraham said, I can't. Revelation 20, verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Here a while back, they gave me a shot in my back to ease me of my pain and discomfort. And it had the exact opposite effect on me. I hurt so bad I was crying, laying on the couch in here, crying my eyes out, begging for relief from it. The only relief that I had 
was I had some muscle relaxers that knocked me out. And you know what I did? I took them so that at least while I'm asleep, I'm not in extreme pain. And when I wake up, I took some more. And when I wake up, I took some more. And I took them until I slept through a lot of the pain time. You won't get that. Night and day. Torment. No relief. And I, I hate, I hate even have to talk about this. But this is church. And I'm supposed to warn you about hell. And I don't want to go there. And I don't want you to go there. And you will. If you keep lying to yourself and everybody else about who you are, you're going. Get honest. Get honest. You don't have to get, get honest with God. God will deal with everybody else. Get honest with God. Okay? So, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to open up the altars, the, the benches here. If you're lost and you don't want to go to hell, you come to me and say, show me how I go to heaven. I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. If you're saved and you're thankful, come tell God. And mention somebody that you know is going. And you know somebody is going. If you're backslid. And, you, and the lower you get, the hotter it is. And you're there. You come. 